We're very thankful to have another opportunity to come here to Friendship Missionary Baptist Church and we're thankful that the Lord has given us the health and strength and the freedom to be able to come this way and uh, thankful that uh, He's still providing us health in our bodies to be able to get up and go. Um, if things are well with you, you need to thank the Lord and uh, if you'll look around, you'll see people that are in worse shape than what you are and you need to pray for them and most of all, we need to pray for these that are lost and without God. Um, I've had a verse of scripture uh, on our heart for uh, a few days and uh, we're going to read that one verse of scripture and let the Lord lead us uh, where he'd have us to go. Uh, it's in the book of Revelation in the 22nd chapter in verse 17. Uh, it says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now, as we read this verse of Scripture, uh, we uh, see a lot of teaching in it. And we see here is it, it gives an invitation. It says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. I uh, certainly know of the Scriptures uh, that the Godhead is in three parts. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And here we find that here this God, the Spirit, is making an invitation uh, to those that are lost and without God. But not only is God making that invitation, it also says the Spirit and the bride say come. This bride that is mentioned here is not a uh, natural bride, but a spiritual bride. It is not an invisible bride, but one that can be seen, one that uh, can be beheld. And what we know this to be, and not just believe it to be, I, I know it to be by the Scriptures, this bride that is uh, being mentioned here is speaking of the Lord's church. So here when we find that it says that the Spirit and the bride say come, that invitation should uh, go out and is going out and has been going out for some 2,000 years uh, from the Lord's church that the Spirit and the bride say come. Now this come is to draw near, is to draw nigh. So here we find that uh, this invitation to come it says him here, and he uh, let him that heareth say come. So hear that those that have come, those that have been saved by the grace of God, let them also say come. And who is it that should come? It says him that is a thirst come. Now this is not a thirst for natural water, but this is a thirst of spiritual water. We find here in the scriptures over in the book of Isaiah in the 55th chapter, in verse 1, it says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. This uh, thirst that an individual has when they are lost and separated from God is not that of the natural sort. But it is certainly a thirst that the individual that has it and is experiencing it knows about. And I want you to understand that if you're out there today and you've never heard the Word of God before, you've never heard it declared to you, I want you to know that you will know when you're lost and without God. I want you to know that there comes a time in an individual's life when they have reached that age, we call it the age of accountability. I've heard it referred to that. What that means is, is there's a time and there's no set age. It's not eight years old or 12 or 25. Every individual is let know of God Almighty. When they become separated from God, there is a trouble there. There is a condemnation, as the scriptures feel, uh, say. And there is a separation from God. There is a death. There is a, a, a certain feeling that is in the soul of an individual that they know that if they die, they'll go to hell. And this is not of the mental sort. Many people will say, well, no, I, I don't believe I'll die. But yet in their heart, they're in their actions, they're always trying to do something to not die and go to hell. They're working towards it. Well, this... This desire, this trouble, 
that becomes on an individual when they become spiritually thirsty, you're going to know it. I heard a preacher say recently that he had been outside working and was just overcome with heat and he was thirsty. He said, but nobody had to tell me I was thirsty. I knew I was thirsty. I knew when I needed a drink. I knew when I needed something and I knew uh, and nobody else had to tell me. I want you to know today, you don't need to let anybody tell you you're lost. You don't need to let a preacher, you don't need to let a deacon, you don't need to let a mom and dad, a grandparent, someone that you've grown up come and tell you that you're lost. That is not their business to tell you you're lost. It ain't your business, anybody else's business to tell somebody that they're lost without God because that's the Lord's business. Now I'm going to say this right here to anybody that wants to listen. We don't need to be talking to people about their soul too young and getting them on the altar, getting them upset. I've seen people as a little child, uh, they begin to cry and they get upset because somebody talks to them. Tears ain't being lost. I'm going to tell you what being lost is. That's that trouble and condemnation inside. Let me tell the danger of getting somebody on the altar and seeking the Lord that's just emotionally upset because you said something to them or something's got them worried and, and people begin to ask them got too many questions and, and get them to a point where they think something's wrong with them that they're lost because they're crying and people are asking them. They'll come to an altar. They'll bow down somewhere. They'll get their cry out and they'll feel better. And somebody will say, don't you feel a little better? I'm going to tell you what, that's dangerous. We need to let the Lord let them know that they're lost. And we also need to make sure that when they're seeking the Lord that we're not talking them up. We need to make sure that when they're on the altar that we're not trying to ask them if they feel a little better. A sinner will not feel a little better when the Lord saves them. They'll feel all the way better. And I want to say that because I know that goes on in the world where they'll say, you've prayed enough. They'll say, well, don't you believe that the Lord died for you? And you'll say, a uh, person say yes. Well, then you're saved. I'm going to tell you, it's more to it than that. And you'll know. None of those things, none of those things that other people might have good intentions for will ever satisfy that thirst, that longing in the depths of your soul till the Lord saves you. So here we find everyone that thirsts. If you ain't lost, you can't seek the Lord to be saved. So this is to those that are lost and without God. Come ye to the waters. Now this is not talking about going down to the creek. This is not talking about getting in a baptistry. This ain't talking about going down to the ocean. This ain't talking about something like that. These waters that are mentioned are talking about the living water. We find here in the scriptures, over in the book of John in the fourth chapter, as the Lord was departing there and going into Samaria, uh, it says here in verse 5 of John 4, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being wearied at his journey, sat thus on the wall, and it was the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of, the Samaria, of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. So here I want you to know something about this woman. As the Lord sat there at Jacob's well, the Lord was tired in the body, and he needed water. He didn't need natural water to save him. He needed natural water for this body. But here this woman of Samaria come along, and they were looked down on. The, the Jews didn't look upon them very favorably, and they didn't have any interaction. And she knew by looking at him that he was a Jew. She knew that he knew that she was a Samaritan. And we look and we find that the Lord, even in speaking to her, that it, well, it surprised her, just to be honest. Verse 8 says, And his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So that just confirms those things that I said, that even she thought, how is this man asking me for water? Hey, they don't, we don't mix. Notice what the Lord said. 
And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked me of him, and he would have given thee living water. This was not a water that could be drawn out of a bucket. This was not a water that could be poured out of a faucet. It is not water that could be touched with man's hands or applied to the body. This living water is a spiritual living water, one that only God could give. He said, if you knew who I was and who it is that speaks of you, you would be asking me right now, for living water. I want you to understand today, you that are lost and without God, you may think I don't know where the Lord is. I'm going to tell you what, the Lord's all around, and I want you to know that He is wanting you to ask Him for this living water. He says, let the Spirit and the bride say come. The invitation is to you today that you would come to the Lord with all your heart and you would get a drink of this living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep, and from whence hast thou this living water? She didn't understand. She didn't understand. She was at, he was at a well. She was looking at all this, rationalizing it. And that's what a lot of people try to do today. They try to rationalize their way to heaven. They try to rationalize the Scriptures. They try to rationalize faith. I'm going to tell you what. You will never be saved if you're going to rationalize it with your mind. You can't figure it out. It's a heart work. And if you don't trust the Lord with all your heart, you'll never be saved. This woman here, she said, you, you ain't got nothing to draw with. What are you talking about? There's, there's, this ain't even possible. There may be people that will listen to this or heard other sermons and other preachers and say, there's no way the Lord will save me. Yes, He will. Yes, He will save you. If you'll put your trust in Him, you'll call on Him. With all your heart, I can assure you, He'll save you. It says, and art thou greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank thereof himself, his children, his cattle. And Jesus said, answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. She said, are you, are you greater than Jacob? Are you greater than the one that gave us this well that we have watered with all these years that have nourished us, nourished our animals? Are you greater than he? He began to tell him, if you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. Let me tell you something. You may be today saying, I'm going to dress up and I'm going to go to church or I'm going to go as I whatever and I'm going to go to church and I'm going to do better. I know people that do that. Good hearted and good meaning. You might think to yourself, I'm going to go and I'm going to tithe to the church and I'm going to give to them and that's going to mean something. And when that don't satisfy you, well, I, I tell you what I'll do, I'll go to Bible study. Maybe that'll help me. Well, what I'll do is I'll go out and invite people to come to church. That'll, that'll help me to feel better. That's bound to be what will work and that's going to mean something to the Lord. I'm going to tell you what, you can try everything you want of the natural sense, the works of man, and it will always leave you thirsty. You'll have to keep going back and keep going back knowing that it ain't done you any good whatsoever. I just read a testimony. Somebody not long ago, the preacher had went down to pray with them, and the preacher was doing the praying. The preacher was praying with them, asking the Lord to come into their heart. Mind you, the preacher was doing the praying. Then the preacher would come up, ask the young man, how you feel? I don't feel nothing. Don't, ain't nothing changed at all. Did it three or four times. Don't feel nothing at all. Said he seen the preacher the next day, and when he got to praying, when he prayed to prayer, not right on the preacher and his good works and his ability to get through, when he asked the Lord to save his soul on the way home, he got saved. I'm going to tell you, you can let any preacher you want try to pray for you. It can't get through. Your prayer is going to have to be the one that's prayed. Your prayer is the one that's going to have to be lifted up. 
If you're going to drink of the water of the natural things of this world, you're going to depend upon a man. You're going to depend upon an action. You're going to depend upon any kind of work of any kind. I can tell you, you're going to be thirsty. You might ease your mind and your conscience and you think, well, and others may tell you, oh, you're doing good. You're doing good. I'm going to tell you what, you're going to be just like them in the scriptures. In the book of Matthew, it says, one of these days, there at judgment, they're going to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, in thy name, we've done many more, uh, wonderful works. In thy name. There's a lot of people in the world, religious people, not saved people, mind you, religious people. And they are that way. They're doing many wonderful works. But yet, they ain't never been saved. They've never been to the fountain of living water. They've never been to the Lord, the true fount of which this living water flows. And when you go to Him and you get a drink of this water, it will be in you a well of water, says the Scriptures, unto everlasting life. When you get a drink of it, you'll never have to go back and get another drink again. It is the thing that will quench your thirst and which you'll never need a drink of it again. This woman upon hearing it, she said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. She went up there to that well to get her a bucket of water. She didn't come expecting that the Lord was going to be there and that she was going to find salvation. And they went on and they began to talk and, and she began to tell, well, I've heard of one to come. I've heard of one that's going to come. And the Lord said to her, she says here in verse 25, and the woman saith him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he'll tell us all things. She had heard about the coming of the Lord. She had heard of the prophecy. She knew that he was coming and when he would come that he would tell them all things. He would show them the way that he would be the one to trust in. And I want you to know right here, she said, I believe when he comes, when he is here. She was right there. She had asked for the water. And he said, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak to thee am he. I believe right there in that moment in time that the Lord showed her who he was and she know it on the inside. I'm going to tell you what, when a person is saved by the grace of God and they get a drink of this living water, when they get a drink of this, the Lord lets them know who he is. You know it after the inward part of you. And I want you to understand that there's many things in the world being told that maybe you've done enough. You won't ever do enough. I, 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 I'm sorry as they ever come. I'm depending on what the Lord done for me as a nine-year-old boy when he saved my soul. But I want you to know there ain't a preacher alive that can tell you you've done enough. There ain't a preacher alive that can tell you a church, I don't care how big and glamorous it is, if they've not told you to seek the Lord with all your heart until you've been saved, till you know you've been saved, and that peace comes in your heart, I'll tell you they're deceivers. Because there ain't any other way to go about it. And if you want a drink of this living water, you don't want to be thirsty no more. You want this to change. You're going to have to go to the only one who can help you, and that's the Lord. Let's go back here to this verse of Scripture in Revelation. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hear it say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. I want you to know today that this uh, gift, and it is a gift, scriptures say that it is for by grace are you saved through faith, it is the gift of God. This gift that is given to you doesn't cost you anything. It cost our Lord his life. He had to suffer and die for you to be saved. But for you... If you'll come of a broken heart and a contrite spirit and you don't come, I, I let me just say what's on my heart. Not walking down the aisle chewing chewing gum. I mean, you're going to walk right up here and shake the preacher's hand and everything's going to be hunky-dory. I'm going to tell you what, that ain't no trouble and sorrow in that. 
You might not show it with the outward part of you, but the inward part of you is going to have to be broken. It's going to have to be troubled. You're going to have to know that you have nowhere else to go to get this taken care of, and you go to the Lord putting all your trust in Him. Every bit of your being, everything, let it go, and putting your trust in the Lord, and if you'll come, He'll save whosoever will come. I mean everybody that'll come. You might say, no, I don't believe he'll save everybody. There's some in the world believe only certain amounts going to get saved. Let me tell you what, the Lord didn't come to save just a certain amount. He come and died on that cross to save everybody. Everybody. The scriptures say in Romans 10 and 13, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that those that are lost and without God they're going to have to do some calling on the Lord. They're going to have to do some asking. We find the scriptures to say the same thing in Acts 2 and 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to understand that the world won't tell you this. They'll make fun of us for it. Make, make fun of me for it. They'll say, I'll never bow and call on the name of the Lord. I'm never going to make a spectacle of myself like that. I won't tell you something. Everybody that is ever going to be saved will have to call on the name of the Lord. Will that always be out loud for everybody to hear? I, I ain't going to say that it is. When I was lost, I started calling on the Lord out loud at the beginning. I don't know that I was uttering a word out loud when the Lord saved my soul, and I know that others have told that same testimony. Some have been by themselves, and they'd call on the name of the Lord. Some have just prayed from within, calling. I might not have been saying a word outside for anybody else to, to hear, but inside I was calling on the Lord. And I won't say something else. There may be some, listen to this, to the church. I want you to know this right here is a good place for you to go seek the Lord. We've almost made it say, well, I know, and I know you can get saved anywhere. I, I, I know people that's got saved in cars and tractors, uh, in planes, been saved at work, been saved in a farm. I want you to understand you can get saved anywhere, but if you say, I ain't going to an altar, you might as well go ahead and get ready. I'm going to tell you what, I ain't ashamed to go to the altar and I encourage you, if you go to the Lord's church, I'd be going to the altar and I'd say, hey, Lord, I want to be saved. You might say, this bitch don't mean nothing. It ain't got no better virtue in it than that bench over there or that one, this and sitting here behind me. Get saved on any of them. Get saved anywhere you put your trust in the Lord. We call it an altar, but it's a mourner's bench. That's what it represents. That's what I've heard it called all my life. A mourner's bench. You know why it's called that? Because we got to be a mourner. Everybody has got to be a mourner if they're ever going to be saved. You ain't going to get to that peace with God. The scriptures don't teach it. If you've not had trouble and sorrow, it says that you must repent on the uh, Lord uh, to God and believe in the Lord with all your heart. I want you to understand the scriptures teach that it is the godly sorrow, that trouble and sorrow in that soul. It must be present. And I can assure you, when that heart gets troubled, you'll go to calling. You'll get to asking. The Lord ain't going to make you. He's not going to make you, but he's asking you to come. He's begging you to come. And I'm begging you to seek the Lord of the church here at Friendship. The whole reason that this broadcast, whatever anybody wants to call it, continues to go out is so that lost sinners can hear what they need to hear to be saved. You might say, well, preacher, you don't preach it every time. I preach the best I can what the Lord lays on my heart. But I'm going to tell you what, the church of the true and living God says come. Come to the waters. Not that the church can save you, but it will pray with you. The Spirit and power can be here, and the church will direct you where you need to go, which is to our Lord. Whosoever will come. Preacher, I've been mean. I'm a sinner. He'll never save me. He'll never save me. You, if you only knew what kind of person I was, you'd know that the Lord never saved me. He said, whosoever will, let him come. Now, I've done all this to get to here. Whosoever will, 
let him come and take of the, uh, the well, let me get it right, I can't even quote it. Whosoever let him come and take of the water of life freely. Whosoever, all. Oh, he didn't just die for people that some that thinks that are morally good. I can tell you right now, there ain't none of us good. The scriptures say that all of us are sinners. All of us are sinners and come short of the glory of God. All of us at our best state is vanity. All of us, our righteousness or our goodness is as filthy rags. So, well, I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I know what you're saying, but he won't ever save me. Well, he saved a woman one time, I find in the book of Luke in the seventh chapter. This woman, she went in and scriptures say here, if you'll read sometime there, starting in verse 36, she went into a Pharisee's house. These Pharisees were pretty self-righteous. They began to think too much of themselves. I'm going to tell you what, don't none of us need to think too much of ourselves. Uh, we, we, we don't need to. We need to stay humble. That's what the Lord teaches us. This woman knew that everybody in that house, all them people at Pharisee and all them people, she already knew they would, what they would think of her. She knew what they'd think of her. When in this man's house... In there, he's a Pharisee, all puffed up, and thought he was better than everybody else anyway. Honestly, thought he was better than the Lord. And this woman coming in, she said, it says here, this woman, uh, uh, a woman in the city which was a sinner. But she knew that Jesus sat at meat the Pharisee's house, and she brought an alabaster box full of ointment. She knew where the Lord was, and she went there to find him. She went there to get forgiveness. She was a sinner and she knew she was a sinner. The Lord already knows you're a sinner. He died for sinners. The scriptures say He didn't come to save those that were right, call them that are righteous to repentance, but those that were sick, meaning those that are lost, those that are sinners. He used to sit down with the publicans and the sinners and the Pharisees talked about it. I'm going to tell you I'm glad that He took time for this old sinner. And he'll take time for you. She began to sit at his feet behind him, weeping, crying. She took the hairs of her head and she, her tears were so many, she began to wash his feet, take her hairs and clean his feet, fix them with that ointment. She knew that he was the Son of God and the only one that would forgive her and could make her life right, could make her soul right, could forgive her of all that she's done. I want you to understand, you might think man will forgive you. Man kind of like bearing an axe sometimes. We put the head down in there and we leave the handle out so we can grab to it every time we can. Let me tell you what, when the Lord saves you, he's going to throw her away. It's gone. When you trust the Lord with all your heart, He saves that soul. And that's the end of it. You ain't got to worry. Will He ever bring it up to you again? No, not our Lord, because He ain't like we are. He ain't sorry like me. He is God Almighty and loves your soul. She washed the hairs of His feet, and it says here in verse 39, Now when this Pharisee, which had been him, saw it, he spake within himself. This Pharisee didn't say it out loud, but he was thinking it. And I'm going to tell you what. You think something, the Lord knows what you're thinking. He reads the hearts. He knows the desires and intents of everybody's heart. Yours, mine, everybody's. It says here that he was speaking within himself, saying if this man, if he were a prophet, this Pharisee didn't believe this was the Son of God. He didn't believe that the Lord was who he said he was. He said if he were a prophet. Didn't he believe he was a prophet? If he were one would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Now see what this man thought was, that's what a sinner looks like. It looks just like her, not like me. He wasn't a sinner, but she was. You know, a lot of people have got this conception in their mind, this is what a sinner looks like. Uh, that they're rough and, and, and they carry on, and, and some sinners do get out and drink. Some sinners do run around. Some sinners do live like the devil. Some sinners uh, do murder. They do. They're sinners. Not only in the outward flesh, but inwardly lost and without God. But you know what? They're sinners that sit in church houses every Sunday too. They're sinners that uh, serve in government uh, 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 offices. They're sinners everywhere. Everyone's a sinner. I want you to understand this, man. 
He didn't think he looked like a sinner, but he was pretty sure she looked like one. You want to know what a sinner looks like? Just look at this one right here. All I am is a sinner saved by the grace of God, and I want you to understand even more so. It didn't matter what this man thought of her. It's what the Lord thought, what she thought of herself. She knew she was a sinner, and she knew the Lord was the only one to help her. You read on down through where we're not going to take all the time reading all that, telling this man about how this woman had come in and done all these things and he hadn't done any. He said in verse 47, For wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little was forgiven, the same loveth little. Did her tears save her? Did her hair wipe it? Did the cost of that alabaster box of ointment, is that why the Lord saved her? For those natural things, the things that you can touch, is, is that what saved her? He said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that said it meet, which began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? His name's Jesus, that's who he is. And he said unto the woman, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. She came into that house a sinner. Came into that house broken. Came into that house low as she could be, knowing that she needed forgiveness from this man, Jesus. This other man, he needed it just as bad, but he didn't think he did. That's a bad state to be in, to be lost and to not even think that you need anything. That's a dangerous space to be in. But this woman come... She had many sins. She was brokenhearted. She come to the Lord and he forgive her sins because she believed with all her heart. You might say, but that don't convince me. Let me tell you. You might say, well, but you just don't know. I don't know what all this woman done, but she done a lot of sin. I read about a man they call the Apostle Paul. That's what he was named. The Lord changed his name. But at one time he was called Saul. You know what that man Saul done? He hated the church of the true and living God. He hated Jesus and everyone that proclaimed him so much that he persecuted him. He had thrown him in jail and there was a man named Stephen that he sent out and he consented to that man's death. Consented to it. Allowed it to happen. Might as well done it himself. He might as well throwed all the rocks that stoned him himself. And do you know what? The Lord brought that man down and the Lord saved that man. I want you to understand it doesn't matter if you're a drunkard. If you'll come to the Lord, whosoever will. It doesn't matter if you're an adulterer. Whosoever will. It doesn't matter if you're a murderer. Whosoever will. It doesn't matter if you're a liar. Whosoever will. It doesn't matter if you're a thief. Whosoever will. Whosoever will. Let him come. I'm going to tell you what, you may go being all those things just like that woman was. You may go into the house of God. You may go out onto the farm. You might get out in your car and you may go in one direction. You may be looking for the Lord and you may be all those things. You may be a moral person. Whosoever will, let him come. Let him come. Oh, come. Come to me, he says. Come and I'll save you. Believe me and I'll save you. Let it go and I'll forgive you. Whosoever will. The devil will tell you you can't be saved. He'll tell you you're a lost cause. He'll tell you that nobody will ever believe you. The Lord will. And I'm going to tell you what happens when a person gets saved. And he, they think of that water. They drink of that water. You know what? They won't tell somebody about it. I'm going to tell you what, when you get saved, you need to tell somebody about it. That woman at that well, she left that water pot. She went up there for business. She forgot all about it. She met the Lord, and she forgot all about it. And she went telling others about this man, Jesus. That woman there that had her sins forgiven, her name was Mary. Let me tell you what, she went there. I believe her name was Mary. She went on there. She began to follow the Lord. She won't stay close to him. She stayed close to him all the time. She liked to stay right where he was. I'm going to tell you what, she didn't care who knew it. It didn't matter what her life had been before. From then forward, she was going to follow Jesus. I'm going to tell you what, 
When somebody tells the old time testimony of salvation, that Spirit of God bears witness with us. We can fail it. We can know it. It wrestles with what we know. And I want you to understand today, the devil's running somebody, telling them they can't never be saved. It's on me. I know that that's what's going on. I don't know with who, but the Lord knows. And the Lord says, whosoever will. Anybody. Anybody that will. Anybody that'll come. If they'll come, believe. With all their heart, not depending on themselves, not trusting with themselves. Anybody that will, I'll give you this water. I'll give it to you, and you'll never thirst again. This is our effort. I know it's scattered. I pray that the Lord will clean it up and use it just where it needs to, to go right in the heart of those that are lost. May God bless you. Thank you for listening.